talk about their experience by military authority in those days and on dire consequence if they did, felt that in here in the 70s, many, many years later, uh, that they didn't want to go to the grave with their story. They wanted to tell somebody reliable. And being a local boy and having been to the moon, they considered me reliable enough to whisper in my ear their particular story and their association with uh, the Roswell crash, including the family of the undertaker who provided coffins uh, for the uh, alleged vi alien victims and others on site who had been involved or knew the story. And of course, eventually I ran into Jesse Marcel Jr., the son of uh, the Jesse Marcel, who was the first military officer on the site and knew his story and I knew his story well and we became friends in later years in this disclosure movement. And uh, at some point about 10 years ago, and I can't remember what date it was right now, when the disclosure movement was under <coughs> going strongly, I came here to Washington with a Navy commander by the name of Will, Will Miller and Dr. Stephen Greer and we have, were able to get an appointment at the Pentagon to talk about what we knew or what we allegedly knew, what we thought we knew, and went and told our story. And uh, the powers that be at the Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff listened to our story and said, the uh, Admiral said, well, I don't know that story. I don't know that that's true, but I will find out. So we departed, went on our way, and subsequently learned through uh, Dr. Greer and through Will Miller and that uh, those stories had been confirmed and that the Admiral had been denied access when he tried to get into the inner workings of that process. And uh, we had confirmation of, of that although that animal now des denies the fact that uh, this is a fact. So <clears throat> my story is essentially that I do have no first-hand experience with the ET effort, except the fact that I know all of these research people that you'll hear from today, and those some who are not here today, who have spent a long amount of their lives and time <clears throat> doing research into the alien visitation, UFO crashes and so forth. And I urge that those who are doubtful read the books, read the lore, and start to understand what has really been going on because there is no doubt we are being visited. And as a person who is a part of the first generation of being a spacefarer of our civilization and having gone to the moon and <clears throat> realizing that I do and many of us do now that have seen the Hubble's pictures from space, the universe that we live in is much more wondrous, exciting, complex, and far-reaching than we were ever able to know up to this point in time. And uh, the fact we have wondered, were we alone in the universe forever, only in our period do we really have evidence, no, we're not alone. We are just one planet with intelligent life on it, and probably it is time, now that we are spacefarers on our planet, that we get active because we're really universal beings. And in the long stretch of things, if we think about it in the longest possible range, we realize, and I realize this from my studies in astronomy and astrophysics, our sun will burn out in due course, and we have to be off this planet if our species is to survive. So anybody, any species, any planet that is on around the mainstream star like ours is only has a finite amount of time on that star before it burns out. And so our destiny, in my opinion, and we might as well get started with it, is become a part of the planetary community of nations, of, of planets, just like uh, when we were much newer on this planet and we found tribes over in the next valley or across the next mountain, and we started forming communities then and reaching out beyond ourselves. At this point in 
human history on this planet, we're now starting and ready should be to reach out beyond our planet and beyond our solar system to find out what is really going on out there. And the 20th and 21st century that we now live in, <coughs> the beginning of the, the Industrial Revolution really didn't take off until the 19th century. And I tell the story to some of my younger audiences, particularly in school, that my great-grandparents went across from South Georgia to West Texas in a covered wagon at the end of the Civil War in the 1870s. My family, my father's generation, was involved with going off the planet in aircraft. And less than 100 years later, I went to the moon. So from covered wagons to going to the moon in less than 100 years is a history of the development of our civilization in not our lifetime, but a couple of generations. And so it's t time to start thinking in those terms. And particularly since now, in the 20th and 21st century, we suddenly find that due to our expertise and our genius in science and technology, we have exploded our population from under two billion at the beginning of the 20th century to over six and a half billion at this point. And our consumption patterns are clearly indicating that we are utilizing our non-renewable resources at an unacceptable rate, a non-sustainable rate. So we've got a lot of thinking to do about what being an advanced civilization really means. But let's put all that aside for a moment because we're here to talk about disclosure. And what I am suggesting is it is now time to put away this embargo of truth about the alien presence. And I call upon our government to open up like other governments have, and you will hear about that this morning like the Belgians have, the French have, the Brazilians have, the Argentines, the Mexicans have all released their files. It's about time now that we do the same thing and become a part of this planetary community that is now trying to take our proper role as space-faring civilization. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> We're not like to bring, uh, like to bring forward, uh, make a few comments. Dr. Milton Torres. Dr. Torres? Here I come. All right. <laughs> a little slow. David, By the way, Dr. Torres David. and Dr. Mitchell, about a year and a half apart. He's senior to me. <laughs> Just a touch. As a matter of fact, we never met until today, uh, I, this session. Uh, uh, when he launched, I was there. I was the chief of range control at the time at Cape Kennedy. It's amazing how you work your way up. And he went to the moon. I just sat there and watched him. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a real brief one on my biology, on my biograph, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my father was born in Key West in 1888. He went north to New York to make his fortune, whatever it was. Well, he was getting kind of old. And he decided, well, well, I want to go back home to Florida. So he took me back in 1950 to Florida. And there I stayed until the Korean War. When the Korean broke up, War broke out, I said, geez, I want to fly. I, I, don't want, I don't want to go into the Army. I don't like laying in mud. So, <clears throat> so I went to the Air Force and said, sign me up. And they did. I didn't know that I was the luckiest guy in the world. When I was in the Air Force, they said, would you like to be a pilot? Boy, the greatest thing. I had no college, I had nothing. And I volunteered, and lo and behold, I, I was in the top of my class, not the very top, but you know, right number 10 or something like that. But we would have our choice of airplanes when we, when we graduated from flight training. And I picked a fighter. I wanted the F-86F to go to Korea and shoot down some MiGs. I mean, that, that's the way it was in those days. They disappointed me in one sense. They gave me an F-86, but not an F. They gave me the D model. The D model was a new all-weather version so that we could have somebody launch uh, for, on alert to go after 
the bad guys, whoever they may be killing.